Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm the co-host today for your Condo Insider program. And this is the weekly show about uh, condominium living, and we're here to discuss issues that we hope are relevant to people who live and work uh, in condos or have anything to do with condos. And today, as our guest, we have Catherine Piazza. She's the enforcement attorney with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. Yes. Catherine, thank Hi. you for being here. Nice to be here. Why don't you tell us about the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission? What All is right. that? The Hawaii Civil Rights Commission was created in 1990, and we enforce anti-discrimination laws in employment, housing, public accommodations, and state-funded services. And why would that be of any interest to somebody who lives and manages or works in a condominium? Um, it would be important because um, condominiums are subject to the fair housing laws, which um, all board members should know about. And it's important if they do receive a complaint to know how to respond to a complaint and also know our process and what we um, will do and what will happen during that process. Okay, well, who can file a complaint? Can, can an owner file a complaint or a renter? Or who can file a complaint? Well, let's talk about housing complaints. Okay. A housing complaint. So who can file a housing complaint? Um, in terms of housing complaints, almost anyone could file a housing complaint uh -huh. um, if they were harmed. Um, a tenant, a guest, a tester, legal aid um, in Hawaii has testers. Um, they could file a complaint. The, uh, if they allege that they're harmed, um, then they can file a complaint if it's within 180 days. They can file a complaint at our office. They can also file a complaint at the HUD office, the Housing and Urban Development, within a year. And they can file, rather than going through our agency, they can file directly in um, court within two-year period if they feel that they're harmed and um, they are in a protected class. Well, okay, protected class. What's a protected class? Well, in Hawaii, we have specific um, protected classes, and the protected classes are um, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, disability, familial status, um, sexual orientation, HIV, age, national origin, and national origin are protected classes in Hawaii. And so what kind, what kind of complaints are filed with the commission? Give me an example. Um, the most common complaints in housing are disability complaints. Okay. Uh, we also see familial status complaints and retaliation complaints. What? Are, what's? Give me. Give me an example of a a a, um, a, um, uh, a housing complaint. Uh, Housing complaint would well, we they would file under all these protect classes, but the most common would be a disability. So it'd be um, s something like uh, a person requests an accommodation because they have a disability, and um, then the housing per person or the board member doesn't grant the accommodation, and they file a complaint in our at our office. Okay, so that might be like a wheelchair. Yes, that. Uh, if Somebody's someone in is in a wheel, okay. So if someone's in a wheelchair and um, they want to made, make a modification to their unit, such as widening the doors, and the housing provider does not grant that request, they could file a complaint that the housing provider did not provide a reasonable modification to their unit. What about doors? Because doors are sometimes really hard for somebody in a wheelchair to open. Yes. Um, so a modification could be that they widen the doors for their unit. Um, and so the how the if they made that request and they were able to provide verification that they needed that modification and uh, the housing provider did not allow them to make that change, then they could file a complaint at our office. Well, what about, like, like I said, you know, doors are hard. I mean, they're hard for people in wheelchair. They're hard for people who are elderly. Mm -hmm. Or maybe if they're disabled and they're on crutches. And, right. and, and it, the doors are heavy, you yes. know, like the front door. And so what if you said, you know, you go, you go to the manager and say, you know, I'm really having a problem with the doors. Is there something that the association can do? Uh, to, so maybe I can hit a button or, you know, sometimes you go and they have these sensors and the doors open automatically. 
Yes, um, and that's great that you mentioned that because essentially a lot of tenants or residents won't make a, a formal request. They will go to a manager on property or maybe a board member and say, I'm having difficulty with pushing the doors open. And so it's important for that person to, to know that that might be a modification request or an accommodation request and to take it to the board, the board and let them know that that person made the request. In other words, they can't, you can't ignore it when somebody asks. No, you cannot ignore a request. Um, and that's what um, we see is that even a delay would be considered denial. So if, they, if someone made a request um, two months prior and then they took it to the board, that could even be a uh, denial because they delayed it for two months. And what happens if, you, if, there, what happens if the commission finds that there was a denial? Well... So our process, I can kind of, would be that we w the person would file the complaint and then the HCRC um, investigates that complaint. At that point, we're neutral. We will interview the board members, we will interview the tenant or the resident who complained, and then um, a reasonable cause determination is made, and that's when it gets transferred to the legal team. Um, the legal team will then review the case and we will try to settle the case. Um, um, oftentimes in settlement complainants will ask for monetary relief which includes emotional distress, um, it would include actual damages and if we're not able to settle it then we would go to a hearing and then we could ask for punitive damages, we could ask for attorney, attorney fees and so it's important to, to know that um, in the big you know we are just investigating it in the beginning, but at the same time, um, there may be large uh, payouts that the board, board of directors and the association will have to pay if we do find a violation and have to go to hearing. And you're talking about fines in, in addition to attorney's fees if you're found. Yes, we could do um, civil, civil fines if we uh, proceed to uh, an administrative hearing, yes. And when you talk about civil fines, what, how much money are you talking about? Uh, well. It, it would depend upon what the hearings examiner will will award, but the uh, one violation in, under our statute is five hundred dollars. So there might be multiple violations, and then there's also emotional damage um, to the complainant, which can go from we I've settled cases um, from five thousand all the way to seventy five thousand to hundred thousand dollars. So um, it it can cost the board a lot if they decide that they don't want to comply with the law. So they might even, so, so that, that means that if they're found uh, guilty of denial of, uh, a, of an accommodation or, or, or discriminating against the complainant, mm -hmm. that means that they might pay a fine of several thousands of dollars as well as paying an award to the complainant. Yes. So, I mean, this could be very expensive. Yes, it could be. Um, that's why we do encourage settlement um, during the investigation and we try to get the complainant um, what they would want, you know, either the modification or the accommodation in a disability case. And then we try to encourage settlement after we find uh, a charge. However, um, often, you know, if they do not decide not to settle, it, it becomes even more costly as it goes on to a hearing and it could even be appealed to circuit court. So it, it, uh, these cases um, can go on for years if the board members decide to continue to um, fight. And Let me ask you about another one. We were talking about, you, you mentioned familial status is a protected class. Yes. What does familial status mean familial, to people who, yes. who have never been involved with the Civil Rights Commission? Right. Familial status is a... Uh, protected class in Hawaii under state and federal law and it means that if a person is protected under this class if they are domiciled with a minor child and or they are get, trying to gain custody of a minor child and in Hawaii we often see that a lot of um, families have Hanai relationships and so that is also protected under uh, the Hawaii Hawaii law so uh -huh. it would be a family with a minor who is living with a minor child and in in Hawaii in particular it would also be Hanai children and so what kind of complaints do you get re re relating to familial status uh, we see 
complaints ranging from discriminatory statements such as um, in their advertisements when someone posts something on Craigslist for a rental, they might say, no children allowed. And that's not permitted? No, it's not permitted because it uh, particularly points out children and it, it, it excludes children from the rental unit. Um, the other type of case that we see is policies that prohibit children from playing on the premise. So you mean like house rules? Yes. House rules that use the word children. Yes. So, so that should be a no-no. So that the, the <laughs> no-no for condominiums is look at your house rules mm -hmm. and see if the word child or children appears anywhere in the house rules because more than likely those rules are probably discriminatory and in violation of this familial status rule. Yes, and we do understand that there is maybe a concern for someone skateboarding on the side of the on the sidewalk. However, we would recommend that you say no skateboarding rather than no children skateboarding. Um, so you want to just um, make it as neutral as the rule as neutral as possible and Oftentimes with familial status, um, you may even put in a different protected class. So it would it be fair for someone to say um, no disabled people on the sidewalk? Or, you know, so if sometimes um, it's uh, housing providers can replace um, these protected classes to see if it, if it would be a violation. Mm -hmm. So that means that if, in this, if, if you had a swimming pool and there were signs on the swimming pool, that said, no children without adults. That would be discriminatory? Uh, depending upon the, the reason um, and the safety concerns, but you would want to um, look to the, the rule and see why that rule is in place and try to make it so that there is a rational reason for that, for that rule. Um, if no children can be in the swimming pool without adults. Um, why? And um, it's just like saying no disabled people can be in the pool without an adult. So that so uh, you you it it it's con I the board members are concerned with safety, but that's also the parents' concern. That's not actually the the association's concern. Um, and it's better to make neutral policies, neutral rules that um, don't reference children. And, and, and so you're saying basically the house rules, they have legal consequences. So maybe the association, the board should take a look at their house rules to see if the yes, children, that would be a good idea. Ch children are mentioned, uh, are singled out in the rules mm -hmm. and maybe disabled. And, and they should really look at their, their house rules with, uh, with a view to trying to pick out those, yes. those provisions that seem to, to target a specific uh, category of yes. people. Yes, I would recommend that they look at their, their house rules and consider whether or not they can revise their house rules to, uh, to not um, pin out a particular protected class. Okay, well we're going to take a break right now for, for a little while and we're going to come back and uh, talk more with Catherine. All right. Okay. Hello, this is Martin Despang. I want to get you get excited about my new show, which is Humane Architecture for Hawaii and Beyond. We're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey with us. We are here every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. and we really want you to be with us where we look at the options and choices of end-of-life care. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I serve as senator from the Big Island on the Kona side and I'm also an emergency room physician. My program here on ThinkTech is called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'll have guests that should be interesting to you twice a month. We'll talk about issues that range from mental health care to drug addiction to our health care system and any challenges that we face here in Hawaii. We hope you'll join us. Again, thanks for supporting ThinkTech. Okay, welcome back. We are here with uh, Catherine Piazza of the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. And Catherine is sharing with us uh, basically uh, a, a good reasons why you know, people who live in condo 
you listeners, you know, should become familiar with the Civil Rights uh, Commission, mainly because they are here to uh, enforce discrimin discrimination laws. And it's really quite important for you to know about the commission and uh, know how it works, because uh, you do, if you don't know, you could face huge penalties, lots of attorney's fees, and, lots of, and, and maybe years of aggravation, right? Yes. Why don't we talk about disability? Okay. We, we already talked about the wheelchair and the doors. Um, can you describe, I mean, I mean, how would a complaint be brought? I mean, would it be the person who's disabled who would bring the complaint? It could be the person who is disabled. It also could be someone who is living with the person who is disabled. And so they would file a PCQ with our office. And what's uh, a PCQ? It's a pre-complaint. Okay. So they file a complaint, um, a PCQ. They can either do that in our office on Punchbowl Street, which is uh, 830 um, Punchbowl, room 411. They can just walk in. Um, they could also file it at um, by going online at our website. And so they can file that, and then they, it would be in, assigned to an investigator. Does it cost money? No, it does not cost money. Okay. Um, so they can file it with our office and it would be assigned to an investigator and they would interview the complainant or the person who is filing on behalf of the disabled person. And then, and then the, it would be investigated. And so they would gain evidence from the complainant as well as the, uh, res we call them respondents, but it would be a housing provider. Uh, and then it would, the process would begin. Okay, and you, we were talking about, um, you know, the request would be to make a reasonable accommodation. What is considered a reasonable accommodation? Uh, so we talked about the person with the wheelchair and the door is not wide enough. Right. So, so he would want to make the door wider. Yeah. That what? would be considered a modification because it's a change in a structure mm -hmm. or, um, or the unit or a common area. Mm -hmm. uh, reasonable accommodation would be a change in a rule or policy. And so uh, accommodation would be, for example, if, some, if their house rules are on the internet and they need a hard copy for their disability, that could be a policy change that they're requesting. Or another common accommodation request is a need for an assistance animal. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other common accommodation request that we receive is a parking stall that may be ne needed for um, someone who is disabled and needs a parking stall that is close to their unit. Okay. And so, um, and so how, do, how do these complaints get to you? Is it that they, 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 the, the, the person who is disabled makes a request to the board to the association and the, the association turns them down or how yes. does it get to the commission? Yes, so uh, the complainant or the person who making the complaint um, comes to us. They, they, it could happen in many different situa situations as you speak, but that's a common example is that they make a request to a board member. They could even make a request to a maintenance worker and nothing happens. And so, they, so, the, so, so what, we're, what you're saying is that for people listening, mm -hmm. they should train their staff that if somebody comes up to them and says, you know, I'm disabled or, or you know, um, I, I, I need to have uh, some kind of a button so that the door opens yes. because it's too heavy or, you know, I, 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 I need some assistance uh, or I, I want to have a, 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 an animal help me. Right. It's very important for the for the board members to be trained, for the maintenance staff to be trained, for anyone who deals with tenants or residents to be trained on fair housing. That is one of the number one mistakes is that there's no training for this. And staff. so if the request is made to an employee and the employee does not pass that on to the manager and it doesn't yes. get to the board. Exactly. And, and, and what if the board says, well, geez, nobody told us. Does that excuse them? No, they're still liable because they're that person is their agent or and they're responsible for training that person who was informed of the request. Okay, and so with this reasonable accommodation, it might mean, okay, we have to allow, you know, a, a change. Who pays for the reasonable accommodation? Let's say opening up the door of right. the unit. Who pays for that? Um, because modifications are more costly than accommodations, usually 
the tenant will pay for the modification. Or the unit owner. The unit owner, yes. Or the, or the per person who is renting the unit, if someone wanted to move in and they said that they would be willing to change the doors, um, that, that could be, be a possibility as well. Um, but in terms of accommodations, because they're very, they don't cost much money for the housing provider, it's usually the housing provider who is required to pay for the accommodation. So let's say you have a wheelchair and you want a ramp. Mm -hmm. Can you make the association put in a ramp? Uh, you can make them agree for you to put in a ramp, but you would be responsible for the cost, um, and you and they can ask for um, you know construct to see who you're planning to um, use to construct the ramp. Um, however, if I w if you do receive federal assistance, such as public housing, they would have to pay for the modification. So I'm not sure if any of your viewers um, live in public housing mm -hmm. or if they're managers at public housing But this um, is facility. something that they should look into. They should be aware yes. that they need to say, okay, uh, we, we need to figure out who's going to pay for this. Right. What about if you have somebody who moves in, who buys a unit, and he, uh, he or she moves in, and they find out that they're allergic to the cleaning solution that's being used for the carpets? Yes, and and, and 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 it, it, it results in a respiratory condition, and they have trouble breathing, and they complain to the board. What's the association supposed to do to address that? I mean, can they just ignore that? They can ignore that. What I would do is, um, if I was a board member, I would ask that they provide verification that they have a disability, and that they that's considered a disability. I mean, they may be uh, chemical okay. sensitivity okay. Uh, would be considered a disability, and that they need an accommodation due to their disability. Um, and so, if they provide that information, then. Um, it's up to the board members to uh, what we call engage in the interactive process. Try to resolve the issue with the tenant or the resident or the homeowner um, so that they, that they are accommodated and can live in their housing um, and enjoy their housing. But what if you get some board members and say, you know, that fluid we, you know, that, that product we buy, we've been using it for years and nobody's complained. That person's a troublemaker. We're just going to ignore her. That would be considered a, a denial, and the, and um, then we would, you know, proceed with probably most likely with a reasonable cause determination if that was the reason why they denied the accommodation and didn't engage in the interactive process with the person. And and it could result in big fines. Yes, it could. It could potentially end up with big fines for the board members. So in other words, when something like this happens, they should really contact their lawyer. No, they don't have to contact their lawyer. That's the important part about training, uh -huh. is that if they're trained um, to know when someone is making a request or potentially making a request, then it should go directly to the board, and then the board should make that decision. Um, the, the rules and the... Uh, how to handle a request shouldn't be necessarily handed off to an attorney. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another issue is that, you know, sometimes the attorney will charge, charge fees to, that, to the tenant or to the, um, to the homeowner because they were requesting an accommodation. Um, so if they are trained their staff, they don't necessarily have to go to a lawyer. If, um, of course, if they have a question, they can address it with their get legal advice. Mm -hmm. But um, the staff should be able to handle all accommodation requests, modification requests um, at, the, at the facility or at the property. And so the important thing really is to listen at, when, when people complain and to basically try to respond to them Yes. And, and, and it's, it, it, it's not improper to say, well, geez, if, if you have an allergy, can you get me a doctor's? Yes. That's what you're asking for, right? Yeah, that you can, under our law, you can ask for verification that the person has a disability if their disability is not apparent. So, for example, in your situation when you um, explained a person in a wheelchair, um, their disability is apparent. So they're not required to give you a doctor's note to say that they need the doors to be widened. Mm -hmm. But in a situation where someone has a chemical sensitivity um, and their disability is not apparent, then uh, 
the board member or the association can require verification from a doctor to show that they have a disability and that they have a nexus or a need for the accommodation or modification. Okay, so once you get the, uh, the verification, once the board gets the verification, mm -hmm. what steps do they have to do to show that they are addressing uh, the request? Well, they can temporarily approve the accommodation and modification, and that's what we usually recommend that they do, temporarily approve it if they have um, in maybe something that they're trying to work out. Um, but if they get the verification that they need the accommodation and modification, they should approve the request. Okay, and the approving the request would mean that the association would then have to find some other fluid, cleaning yes. fluid to use that, that is not going to set off a, a negative reaction right. uh, with the resident. Yes. What happens if you have a board member says, you, you know, now we have to go out and get this special cleaning fluid and it's costing us more money. Mm. You know, I want, I want you to watch her and, and if she does something wrong, we're going to find her, we're going to ding her. Yes, and you bring up very important. So, 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 I mean, is, I mean, what's wrong with that conduct, that reaction? Yeah, you bring up something that's very important and that we see a lot at the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission is that uh, when someone comp makes a complaint and then they're retaliated against, that's another violation. So, because they engage in a protected activity by filing a complaint or they engage in a protected activity by just merely asking for an accommodation um, and someone retaliates by, like you said, um, you know, in your comment that they are upset because they asked for um, different chemicals, that would be retaliatory and that could be an actual um, violation of the law. And so, so board members really have to be careful Yes. And, 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 and because there are other board members who are present when they make these comments, and who knows what's going to happen if there's a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people will have to say, well, what did you say in the board meeting? Why, and why, why are you taking action against this one resident? She seems to be getting fines for, for things that are unrelated to her disability, but it seems like you're going after her, like you're mad at her because she's, she's a troublemaker. Yes, I would be careful um, when someone files an action or when they make a request that they, that they treat them fairly like any other tenant or resident and that they don't, um, um, you know, threaten them, intimidate them, create any adverse effects because they, they filed a complaint. Okay, well, um, uh, we're getting towards the uh, end of the show. And, but, you know, we, we have some other issues that, you know, we need to discuss. So you're going to have to come back All right. and, 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 and meet with us uh, because we didn't even get to service animals. No, we didn't. <laughs> that's <laughs> and, a key and, and, topic. And, and that's one of the key <laughs> topics. And so you have to promise to come back and discuss service animals with us next right. time. Well